Hi, and welcome to the Library 2035, Imagining the Next Generation of Libraries webcast series. My name is Sandy Hirsch, and I'm the editor of this book. I'm pleased to host this webcast series featuring several of the book's contributing authors who will share their vision for libraries over the next decade. Today, I welcome R. David Lankes, author of Chapter 6, There Is No Future of Libraries, There Are Many. Lankes is a, Vir a Virginia and Charles Bowden Professor of Librarianship at the University of Texas at Austin. He is the recipient of Bruce's 2021 Isidore Gilbert Medge Award for Distinguished Contribution to Reference Librarianship. He is a passionate advocate for librarians and their essential role in today's society. Throughout Chapter 6, Lankes emphasizes that there is no single future for the library. That is because there is no single community served by the library. The needs, desires, diversity, and personalities of each community will define the resources, services, and programming of each individual library. It is my great pleasure to welcome David Lankes today. Welcome. Uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I am really excited to talk to you about your vision of the future. So let's, um, maybe you can give us a brief overview about what you think your um, the vision for the future of libraries will be in 2035. The vision of libraries to me is, first of all, crafted by a lot of external factors that are going around in society from people seeking to control what information is shared to politics to what have you. But that it ends up that the value and power of libraries, we continue down a trend, which is they've become hyper-local uh, and increasingly look like the communities that they are serving. And the idea is as they become very, the importance of the librarian um, increases because we need to stitch them all together to preserve some level of equity of access and common access to information across all of those buried many libraries. Great. Well, as you're thinking about that future for our libraries, uh, what concerns you as you look ahead? What concerns me is um, obviously that as we look at different communities, different communities are going to have different values. Different communities are going to have different levels of diversity within them. And what I worry is that we're going to end up with very separate service levels. And it sounds really boring and technical, but better way to say that is, you know, we end up with libraries that serve their communities at very different levels of quality, um, of comprehensiveness, et cetera. And we, I also worry that while I think it's a good thing that we become hyper-local, we need those the professionalism and skills of librarians to connect. And so as libraries become hyper-local, they begin to define what a librarian is differently. If we begin to become more isolated in our regions, I think that's ultimately the, the scary scenario is that we end up with very qualities of libraries around the world that don't talk to each other and don't have common sense of intellectual freedom, intellectual ethics, et cetera. Yeah, I, I can see how, I mean, we see a little bit of that already and probably in today's society. So, yeah. Yeah. So what what excites you about the future of libraries? You know, it's there are three horrible things happening, which I think are going to push us into a positive experience. I think one thing that we look at is book, the book challenges, and intellectual challenges. And actually, I think we're at the I always say we're at the end of the beginning of that conversation, which is, you know, when it first started and we had this sort of ideological and political push around libraries and really arguments, some very well intended, some very deeply held values, some rather crass and some ideological and opportunistic. Um, I think librarians and libraries were caught flat footed. We weren't used to being vilified. We weren't used to being used individually as political um, components in a discussion. And I think we've gone from the what us to, <laughs> to the phase of now having gathered data, having demonstrated that we actually have a lot of community support, that there's a lot of commonality across the nation and across the world against book banning, that we now need to begin to sort of turn that to how do we begin to build these community libraries? How do we build on, ironically, the goodwill that's been generated um, out of book banning? Plenty of bad will, but the goodwill. Um, so that's one factor. I think AI 
is an obvious factor right now. It feels very much like when the web was first moving from academia and a few playthings to the mainstream in the 1990s, late 1990s, where everyone had a website, no one quite knew what to do with it. And then it turned into suddenly you can't book a flight without a website and things like that. I think we're in the same case with AI, where AI is already controlling a lot of the infrastructure we're working on, but the generative AI that we're paying attention to, making pretty pictures and terms, we're going to have to come to terms with that. But once again, I think this is where librarians are well situated because a lot of what we're seeing around generative AI are traditional gatekeepers and producers of publications, images, text, et cetera, are being challenged. And they're going to have to move from gatekeepers to facilitators, which is a transition that librarians made. So it situates us well. Um, and then, like I say, this, this push towards hyper-locality. Um, I think those are things that are really shaping the world that we're doing right now. So all of those are opportunities. Um, yes, they're challenges. And it really comes into ensuring that we have a narrative uh, on the values and importance of what we do. Um, and on the people who work in libraries, not just focusing on the institutions of, because we can end up in a situation in 2035 where we have lots of libraries that are run by clerks and people who don't understand what libraries should really be doing and privatized and not serving the, the societal role. That's what we need to avoid. Thank you, David. And what do you think has had the biggest impact on libraries over the past decade? Um, I think it, uh, it it is it is a set of court decisions that were made in the early 2000s that allowed Google's work to be seen as a uh, transformative action and legal. Um, the creation of search engines and the setting of policies that allowed the internet to grow. And that's much more than the copyright things that we talk about. Well, it is around the copyright things we talk about, but not so much the section 200, 215s, et cetera, but literally that idea that says finding information is something that is uh, legal and valuable. That has led to the explosion of Google search engines. It's led to negative sides like the incre increased monetizations of individuals, but that's the impact, right? And so then as the we look at um, libraries, what we've seen parallel to that, a little bit before, is we've seen a massive transition in collections. Everyone sort of looks at maker spaces and public services and says, ooh, that's where all the innovation's occurring. But if you think about how far we've come in the past quarter century from a collection of stuff we own to stuff we own and stuff we license and digitize to anything and everything, but we've been able to create a unified interface to it through search layers, catalog and such. That's a rather amazing transition for libraries. And it's allowed us to do a lot of other things as well. So um, those are two factors that I think that, that really are shaping libraries as we know them today. Excellent. And what do you think as we look ahead, what will have the biggest impact on libraries in the next decade? It's gonna be cliche, but I think AI. I think AI, um, not just because once again, the generative AI, which is gonna be, 2024 is gonna be an interesting year. I think it's gonna, with some of the legal decisions, is this uh, transformative work? Is this not transformative work? But that's the shiny pay attention to it side. The part that we haven't seen is the fact that the music you listen to is influenced by AI algorithms, which influences your mood. Um, the things you look at, the next post, the thing you find in a search engine, is influenced by AI. What we're seeing in education, um, corporatization of the university, but also looking for effects and numerical and quantitative outputs in primary and secondary education, these are AI tools that are gonna to begin increasingly talking about how we create individualized instruction, um, how we do online tutors, how we begin to shape what is and how we learn. I think those that kind of, that back end, that infrastructure aspect of AI is really what's going to shape um, what's going on. And in libraries, how we prepare a community to deal with that, ourselves first, and then those that we're serving. How in academic settings do we redefine information literacy? And then K-12 settings, information literacy standards. How we look um, in terms of the ethical use of these materials as we begin to talk about 
the increasing conflict between, yes, we want to preserve the rights and value of authorship and creativity. At the same time, we want to open those skills up so that everyone can tell their story from their unique lived experiences. So now I can create images using Dali and Midjourney. Um, and I can now do amazing imagery and, and tell my story that I never could before, but it's built on scraping the intellectual property and the life work and, and labor of artists, right? How do we put those two things together? Um, and librarians are the ones that are going to have to figure out, just like we had to figure out the collection side of it becoming this really diverse setting. And, and we're going to have to figure out how that works when we do serve and, and work with folks. Wonderful. Yes, I think those are um, interesting to think about, for sure, about how our role will change and what we all need to be doing. I was wondering, if, um, you know, you submitted your chapter a few months ago, and I was wondering, has your thinking changed at all since you wrote the chapter? So obviously, in preparation for this, rereading it, and I realized that I was in a rather dark place. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you read through it, it's like, um, and, and I think that's the, the biggest change for me from that chapter. Uh, from when I wrote it. Not that I disagree with the trends where we're going. I think I'm right on target uh, for the past two months. Um, but the biggest change is this, the being at the, the end of the beginning of book challenges. Um, we've seen, I mean, the book challenge issue that started grassroots, then became a little astroturfed, has moved into the legislative environment and is now moving into the legal environment, First Amendment challenges and such that those were hard times to be a, a librarian, apologist and cheerleader. Uh, because on one hand, I wasn't in the trenches and like, what can I do to help? Which is a sense of helplessness. And also the fact of just watching really good people go through hard times. What I've seen since then with things like having courts of all different uh, makeups begin to stop book challenges based on First Amendment rights, uh, law being passed uh, around preventing book challenges, book material, including proposed laws in places like Florida that are going to make it expensive to challenge books, which I think is fascinating. I, I see the turn, the turn that we all have to make from um, will there be libraries? Will there be librarians? Will we be putting librarians in jail? Are we going to be looking at intellectual freedom curtailing? Two, really smart, positive responses. Yes, First Amendment um, up being upheld and, and, and um, finding against book challenges and book materials, the idea of some of these laws being challenged around liability, but also librarians having stronger narratives back to that hyper-local setting. Uh, when the director of the Virginia Library Association shows up at board meetings and, and school board meetings with a bill saying, this cost a lot of money because you had lots of important, you know, high level uh, folks working on these challenges, reading materials, making these decisions. Here's a $200,000 bill for what you guys forced into it to that idea of um, intellectual freedom in a place like Austin is a strong sell. But then looking in other places, it may not have its, its different take on. But this is really about freedom and equity and having multiple voices in. When you look at places like Lano County that started banning, then went to court, then realized it was really expensive and then talked about closing the library, having the citizens of Lano show up and say, no, we still need a library. Let's move on. Right. How do we that's that gives me hope. So a very long answer uh, to your very simple question is I think the chapter, um, I think the ideas are there and I'm beginning to see it formed. I'm just in, frankly, a little bit more optimistic place than even when I was writing that that chapter. Well, that's exciting to hear um, and interesting to hear about the shift and and kind of the um, perspective and um, if not the direction that we're heading. So that's that's encouraging. I was wondering, um, do you have any advice for information professionals as they look toward the future? Do I have any advice? Yes. Um, the advice is uh, very much to understand their agency, to understand that when they're going to work within an institution, many of them, um, there are more options now to work as independent consultants, work in places other than libraries as they're working in different information centers. For them to first understand they have to have agency, that they're going to make decisions and they stand by them when 
you know, drawing on book banning yet again, the shift in narrative from we're neutral and we're unbiased and we somehow magically inherit this from our education to we're professionals and we're trained and we make hard decisions on a daily basis. That needs to go into information professionals working in legal, information professionals working in the high tech industry, the finance industry. They have ethics to bring to bear on these situations and it increases their voice and it increases the importance of their voice. We are moving farther and farther and farther every year and have been for decades from the spare parts librarian, the spare parts information professional. Got that phrase from Stuart Sutton many years ago. It's like, oh, the reference librarian died. Wheel out the reference librarian, wheel in the new one, right? We've lost the cataloger, put in the cataloger. Oh, we need a new knowledge manager. Oh, we need a new records manager, et cetera. And now we're bringing in folks who are being trained to think about not only is this the best way, efficiency and effectiveness, which is even more important, is this the right way? Should we continue to do this? Um, and we're in a time of, of perpetual trans transformation. Um, if you look across a uh, an information professional's career over the past, let's say they had a long one and they're retiring this year after 40 years, they have seen phones go from wired boxes on walls to supercomputers in their pockets. They've gone from um, doing everything on paper and, and electric typewriters to word processors to computers to supercomputers in their pocket to, um, you know, that idea that you could get online and you could work on computing to now you can talk to thousands and millions of people to generating revenue through creative output as a side gig. It's a lot and it's only going to get bigger. And that means that we need information professionals who not only can help manage that change for themselves because it's getting bigger and faster, but help communities, whether that's a business, whether that's a place you live, place you study, help communities make that transition and their personality, their viewpoints, their lived experiences are all vital to do that. I, I've talked in the past how we're in a profession of sort of passion plus. If you go into accounting, they teach you how to be an accountant and creative approaches to accounting are not necessarily seen as a positive thing. Uh, <laughs> if you go into the information field and you come from a background in astronomy or literature or art or technology or foreign language or political affairs, you bring that with you. You gain skills that enhance and expand what you can do with that previous background. And that diversity of background, hopefully that diversity of lived experience, of creed, of color, et cetera, is powerful. And we need those information professionals to have the advocacy to understand that we all just wrote a book on the future of libraries, and we really hope that they're going to go through, pick the part that they think is best, and make that happen, regardless of how many folks with gray beards wrote something about it. Great. And do you think um, that there's anything that information professionals can do to better prepare for their desired future? You know, I think, yeah. First is self-reflection. Um, and that's call it critical voice. Um, if you're in the education setting, you call it metacognition. It's the idea of learning to listen to yourself and to debate with yourself. Um, once again, you're gaining a series of skills and tools, whether it's your education, experience or simply a passion for it, but it all comes back to, to what end? What is the impact you wanna have? Understanding that the future is something that, that is, there's a sort of, this is what happens if no one, if you do, if it all keeps going the way it is, this is where we wanna be, there's always gonna be a gap. And learning the tools to minimize that gap is, is important. I think that um, it, it's, I'm teaching library foundations for the first time in years. Um, and so as I'm getting the curriculum and getting the courses, and I understand information professionals larger, I also am teaching the introduction to the information field for 50 graduate students at a time, right? So it's amazing to me how central technology is and technology instruction is not to that conversation. Hmm. It used to be to the day when we teach you how to do HTML, right? Because the information world was on the web and you needed to know HTML and you needed to know possibly some programming and you needed 
we needed to show you what a 3D printer was. And we, we dealt with these individual technologies and individual skill sets. And now what we're doing is we're saying, well, AI, which is technology, is going to change the universe. I mean, I was teaching this class on the information perspectives and I was teaching it to people who are going to be UX designers, people who are going to be librarians, people who are going to be in the AI field, people who are going to do data science. And every week I would show up to class, there would be something new. Well, it turns out today you can't copyright the output of these things. Oh, it turns out today that this is now a major investment. Oh, it turns out today that the people shaping the field are had a coup d'etat and it's just, it's amazing. And so <laughs> that technology and what they're doing is changing rapidly, but we don't teach it the way we used to. We don't teach bits and pieces and parts. We now teach the idea that, you know, it's impact and how we're going to have it. If you want to make an AI chat bot today, first of all, you have to have money, but secondly, you talk to it. You don't go in and program it and use Python or C codes and et cetera. You go in and say, you are a, you know, information professional working in the banking industry with a large understanding of financing and mergers. Um, you pay particular attention to things from the Wall Street, right? This is how you program a chatbot. You talk to it. And that to me is astounding. When we talk about um, creating images, it's no longer your illustration skill, et cetera. It's how eloquent you write. How evocative and descriptive can you be determines the kind of images you can create. And so it comes back to that idea of passion plus, of where they want to be, of understanding their perspectives and their biases and their things and how they express themselves to technology, how they express themselves to their employer, how they express themselves to the world and the narrative that they want to bring forward for how they can make that community better. Wonderful. And what are the key competencies you think that librarians will need to thrive in this new future? The number one competency that information professionals need to bring is the concept of facilitation. Mm -hmm. um, we're walking into environments where you have lots of different voices and capabilities and skills. And we always talk about the information professional sort of taking the business process and connecting it to the technology process. And that can sometimes be the, the nonprofit goal to the resources, et cetera. But it's this sort of middle layer, um, which is crucial because it spans across so many different contexts. So the first skill is facilitation. How do you get people with different backgrounds, perspectives, understandings, and needs into a conversation that will seek some positive learning that comes out of it? I, I use learning and knowledge as a, as a large scale thing. You can talk about strategic directives and plans, but ultimately we're gonna learn something new about who we are and what we wanna do. That's number one. And we used to call those soft skills and we used to just sort of hope it happened. Um, and now we know we can teach that. We can teach confrontation and we can teach, or mitigation of confrontation. We can teach <laughs> uh, identifying of skills. We can teach that sort of way of engagement, et cetera. And so from that flows this idea of the skill sets that we bring to it, right? So one of the things that we know is what are we facilitating? Well, we're facilitating conversations, right? Conversations about what's our new product, what's our strategy, where we're going to go, what's our service. And we know that people will have conversations naturally on their own, and they often are misinformed or uninformed conversations. We've seen over and over again, if you ask someone for their opinion, they'll give it to you. And so part of what facilitation is and the skills that information professionals align around it is to have an informed conversation. This is what we know. This is what we've done. This is our past. This is what we project to the future. Here's what smart people wrote about it. Here's sentiment analysis from social media. Here's what we know from using these tools and understanding the limitations of those tools. And so out of that flows information organization, information seeking. Um, and so out of that flows the idea of community engagement. So, you know, a lot of our old school information skills of how do I find information? How do I organize information? And how do I engage communities to sort of deal with that collection, that corpus, those concepts are there. And they've been there for a couple thousand years. But now it's once again, framing in the context of not how do I have an organization that collects a set of materials or records, how do I understand that I have a community 
know what the narrative and direction of that community is, and then ally the resources, whatever they are, to solve it. So it, it changes the emphasis. So the skills don't change in their core, but they change in their outcome, their impact, and their evaluation. I think that's such an interesting way to represent the changes that we're seeing and need to be making in our field. So I think I think you really uh, captured that well in how you explained that. So my last question for you is to define your view of the future of libraries in six words or less. Community-centered facilitation for good. Yay. <laughs> Maybe not the yay. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much, Dave, um, our David Lankies, for joining me today. And thank you for your contribution to Library 2035, imagining the next generation of libraries. It's been a real pleasure talking with you today. And I have really loved hearing an ex your expanded vision for the future of libraries. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. And thank you for attending the webcast with our David Lankey's author of Chapter 6, There Is No Future of Libraries, There Are Many. To view additional author webcasts from this Library 2035 webcast series, please visit the link or use the QR code on your screen.